Hello and welcome to this evening's stanza event at Big Town Book Festival, both to our live audience and also those of you who are joining us online tonight. My name's Lucy Burnett, um, I'm the new um, festival director at Stanza, um, and I'll be this evening in conversation um, with Don Patterson, who is joining us um, on Zoom from Kerry Muir, I understand. Um, you might have noticed that tonight's reading was branded as a Stanza event, um, as part of which we'll be delighted to welcome to Stanza, as we have for a number of years now, um, some of the winners of the Big Town Poetry Prize at our own festival this coming March. Um, before introducing Dawn, um, I just want to say a few things about our own plans um, for next year. Since this evening's event is in many ways, well actually it is, it's our first event actually during our 2022 series of events which will lead up to our festival which is going to happen from 9th to 13th March next year. Um, our festival title next year is going to be Stories Like Starting Points, um, which is a line from a poem from Holly Pester's um, forward shortlisted collection, um, Comic Timing. Um, we're fingers crossed that we're going to be able to have a live festival, but we will also be doing quite a few um, hybrid events like this. So I'm going to have to be bending Wigton's ears to what they've learned actually themselves during this festival. I'm absolutely sure. Um, and I'm delighted to say that um, the first poet I've actually lined up um, who's going to speak in our opening night is Kathleen Jamie, our new macker, um, which will be absolutely amazing. Um, I just want to make brief mention about, mention about two upcoming new programmes, which we're also going to feature this year. One's called Scotland's Young Mackers, um, which we're going to run a pilot version of this year. Um, and that's going to involve a series of online webinars and then further group and one-to-one -one mentoring for young um, poets in Scottish schools across the country. Um, and also, a, so that's probably going to la launch at the start of January in the lead up to the festival. And also a programme called Well Versed, which is going to see myself in conversation with a number of poets who are going to feature at the festival. And the idea is that we'll launch one of these by Zoom every month, um, support that with some reading notes, and the, view, the aim long term is to actually use that as a means to actually encourage the development of reading groups um, for poetry across Scotland. Um, instead of having a theme for stanza, um, our plan moving forward is instead to have something of a focus, um, a question or an issue which the festival is looking to explore. And this year that will involve the role of narrative in poetry. Um, this doesn't mean we're going to programme lots and lots of narrative poets. Instead, we're going to be asking questions such as what are the pros and cons of um, using narrative and poetry? What stories maybe get traditionally heard and which ones maybe haven't been told? And why, why is that the case? And how can experimental techniques, for example, open up space for new stories? Um, so it's going to be a very broad look um, at the role of narrative in poetry. Um, turning to this evening's event in this context, um, Don Patterson maybe isn't the first poet you'd think about um, when I talk about narrative poetry. <laughs> Most of Don's work is avowedly lyrical. Um, so his first eight collections I would describe as lyrical. Um, he's also got three books of aphorism, which are, how do I say it, aphoristic. Um, but actually, Don is the ideal person, because as I say, our, our festival is not going to be just about programming um, narrative poets. I'm interested in a full range of different poets' um, responses to these questions. And also, um, Don's most recent collection, which I have here, um, Zonal, is, is narrative. It's, I'm going to have to read this out, um, a fantastic science fiction autobiography taking its imaginative cue from the Twilight Zone. Don himself needs very little introduction, as well as his nine poetry collections and three books of aphorism. He's edited numerous anthologies, um, including being one of the editors of the recently published Golden Treasury of Scottish Verse. 
Um, he also has written various books of poetry, criticism and theory, including the ambitious recent publication, The Poem, which, are, which there are copies, I understand, for sale um, here, comprising three extended essays on lyric, sign and meter in poetry. He's won more poetry prizes than is frankly polite, um, including the T.S. Eliot and the Cost and Whitbread twice, all the forward prizes, he's a fellow of the RSL, was awarded the Queen's Medal for Poetry in 2010. He's professor of poetry in Sandwich University. As if this weren't all enough, he's also a highly accomplished musician and composer, this having been his original choice of vacation. Luckily, he's also a rather nice guy, otherwise I might have to start disliking him at this point. Um, tonight, Don's gonna treat you to both some poetry and some music. Um, enough from me, um, I'd like to hand over to Don um, who have asked to maybe share some poems from Zonal before we might go on to discuss actually why he's chosen to take a narrative um, turn in this most recent collection. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Lucy. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, All good. So, uh, beaming in from Kerry Muir, as you say, uh, and having that wonderfully novel experience of being very nervous in your own house, which is uh, <laughs> which some of us have uh, uh, come to know and love uh, recently. I So, uh, I'll maybe read a couple of uh, poems from Zonal, and we can maybe sort of have a chat about sort of the, the subject of narrative. Um, that I realised when I started thinking about it, because I prepared, you know, um, I, I, I really uh, hadn't thought about it much consciously before, you know, and um, it's a far more complicated subject than I, than, I, than I'd thought. In my own case, it was a fairly um, natural turn, I think, because uh, I watch a lot of TV, firstly, um, but... Um, uh, I needed some kind of uh, vehicle through which to write this last book of poems, mainly because it, uh, I'm at that age where a lot of things uh, suddenly happen to you. Specifically, a lot of people suddenly disappear on you um, that are hard to compute. And um, when these things happen to you for the first time in your life, it strikes you as a sort of rupture in the nature of physical law, because I mean, they, all, they have an almost kind of supernatural force when people die and, you, and you're not expecting them to. Um, and uh, the Twilight Zone's sort of predicated on exactly the same uh, idea. There's always like a wee tweak, uh, you know, in natural law. Um, and uh, and everything then proceeds from that kind of sudden kind of uh, asymmetry or or, or, um, or or freakish occurrence. Um, so what I did was just watch the first season of the Twilight Zone, set myself the task of writing a poem for every episode, uh, which was a great idea. But you know, it's, it never quite works out because some of them were quite duff both the poems and the episodes, but all the poems in, in the book relate in some way to uh, uh, one episode or another. They're all at quite a, a distance from the original, but I'll, um, I'll read one that that's, that's plays it fairly close. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a lot of that. Um, uh, and I always wanted to write a poem that was just called Death, because um, so much of my work is about, like most poets, so much of my work is about death or alludes to death. As Billy Collins once said, death is what gets poets out of bed in the morning. Um, but anyway, so this is a, a poem in which one encounters the, uh, the, the figure of death, and death is, has a really rough gig, and he really doesn't like it, you know, and it really gets him down. Um, death. <coughs> one hasn't coughed all day until uh, the reading has started. Death. His trick, by which I mean the way he'd convince you of his earnestness, was to actualize at some random and unpredictable post, unruffled, immaculate, like he'd been there all along, vaping at the turn of the stairs or taking a leak in the adjacent stall, or turning round from the seat in front in the empty matter day, saying, come on, we've been through this. And I'd get up and leave and mutter, I'm not ready yet. And he'd say, okay, bud, see you tonight knowing we all got worn down by this in the end. Before they kicked me upstairs, I used to work in sales. I still have a case of free samples and an eye for an easy mark. One day he was working through some genre cliches just to keep himself amused, and I was closing the bathroom cabinet when I saw him at my shoulder. 
I shrieked, he cracked up laughing. I swung round and we fell into the usual threadbare exchange. But I caught him, running the back of his hand across my Pima cotton towels and sneak a sidelong uh, look at my new sonic toothbrush with more than just a casual interest. I noticed his Prada suit was a size too large and his floral tea cologne was Tommy Girl, though it smelt pretty good on him. It was then I really saw it, his weakness. I said, look, look, I'll do you a deal. No deals, he says, you know that. Hear me out, I say, it's legit. Give me another 20 years and I'll cut you out. I'll be your go-to guy. I'm serious, knock down rates. He said nothing, but the sweat was forming on his upper lip and brow. So I got out the case and I did my old routine. I told him I'm practically giving this stuff away, though it was tough to see him so easily played, so easily reduced, so worried and frantic. Me pulling out one thing after another, him suddenly wondering if he could afford it all, patting his pockets, wondering if I took plastic, wondering if he had plastic, what plastic even was. His arms full of all the cool new things he wanted, a black fedora, a snakeskin belt, a silk tie with a Mondrian design. But then realising that he was technically neither salaried nor self-employed, a slave to his work, he'd always thought, but really just a slave, hand to mouth, hardly ever in the same town two nights in a row, sleeping on couches between gigs, everything he wore lifted from the closets of the dead, everything he ate, whatever the dead had left uneaten on the stove after he'd walked him to the car. All he wanted was a night off, a table at Cleo so he could work through the card and then go home to his own ship, some old jazz on vinyl, a valve amplifier, a good espresso machine and a workout bike and maybe a wife and kids too in time. But whenever he thought of them, or rather what they'd talk about round the big TV, the kitchen table as he made his famous chili at the school gate after hockey practice, all he could think of was him delivering the bad news, as usual, the worst. Daddy, what do you mean I must leave with you now? Don't think for a second that death loves his work. Even though I couldn't stop, we both knew there was no way he could pay for any of this stuff. I was holding back the tears for him. Who wants to see their own death fall to such a two-bit hustle? In the end, I gave up and I hugged him. I said, it's okay, it's okay, I'll go with you. Just give me five to get some stuff and say goodbye to folks. And he was fine with that. And so innocently grateful when I really did come back, carrying a near new pair of brogues, a couple of good shirts and a nice blue jacket that I reckon could fit him well. And I could see in his eyes that over the years, he'd lost more than a few of us this way to this old play. And each of us had cost him like a life. <clears throat> One thing reading these poems, you realise that they're much longer than uh, uh, that. It was longer than you than other poems. So, uh, so maybe I should pause there, Lucy, just uh, because um, the, the, they all come in quite long. These poems. Are you sure you want to share just one more with us? Go on. I'll, I'll, do, I'll just on. do one more, shall I? <laughs> I? I wish I could find a short one, but I'm afraid they don't really exist. Um, that's, that's fine. That's all good. Um, this is kind of that. This is I play a lot of video games. Uh, and this is a, uh, uh, and um, uh, they have improved radically in the last few years. But for a long time, if you wanted to see the patriarchy of a large player video game, you know, um, uh, this, you're very limited what you can actually do. Uh, but it tells you something about life and death. Um, so th this is, it's just called Games. Uh, and that's uh, what it's about. That's, um, uh, uh, for the Irish boy Nick Laves, who also plays games, except Nick plays games with like bloody elves, uh, which I hate. I play proper games. Uh, <laughs> what gave the game away in the end wasn't one of those ghost ship or rapture standbys, the half eaten bowl of porridge, the open shears below the half trimmed hedge or the smoking wand in the deserted milk bar or the pool hall. Well, now I think of it, it was always the same Virginia Slim, two long drawers down, its filter hooped with lipstick like old blood. No, it's that I know that small developers, and I'm damned if there's any money behind this thing, often have to economise on assets. 
One day, I noticed that every house I've ever lived in has the same copy of The Lady with a Little Dog on the bookshelf, the same John Lewis puffball lamp left on overnight in the kitchen table, and the same Hitachi radio beside each identically disordered bed, and set to dry by every kitchen sink, the same chipped green mug that reads, Yoga Kills, and then it clicked. After years of hunting for money and drugs, and what I guess is technically a first-person walking sim, I can say with some certainty that we're offline. This map holds hosts no other soul, not even one NPC to let me make believe. Though it's not as if that ever went well. Once in Grand Theft Auto, abandoning some thrice-failed mission that would have at least got me on the ladder. I took the D to Coney Island in a whim. I jumped down from the boardwalk, and as the shadows ran to meet the one-hour day, stood in the ocean's edge, looking out to Senegal. And then a young woman in jean shorts and a sun hat trapped up the strand and took her silent place behind me. For a long time, we stood there, the little pink and blue wavelets gurgling at her feet as the sun sank into the eastern sea. And who would question that titanic roar? I wanted to say to her. And then instinctively went to find a button on the Xbox controller that would have me turn to her with a lopsided smile or some other charmingly weary salutation. But all I did was punch her in the head. That was literally all I could do. She punched me back twice, hard, called me a motherfucker, and then without rancor, we returned to her sheer meditation. But I was sad. And for all that I suspected, there was something in the excess of that second blow that spoke of her affection. I knew we were the prisoners of circumstance. Inside, though, it's more like LA. No weather, no rot. I keep finding stuff from 40 years ago. Everything is as it was, as it is, as it will always be. Everything, even this fir forest on the edge of town, where I'm presently talking to myself, bears the heartbreaking redundancy of the living rooms of the recently dead. Rooms they furnished with care and with love, or as a hell to their own taste. Only the doors seem to retain any memory. They have slowly accumulated and stored away a little internal will, and over the years have learnt to close behind me silently. One day, the door to some random box will shut fast as a bank vault, and that will be that. Yes, I am familiar with the dream fallacy, the claim that all this is mere apparition, as academic if one never actually wakes. Nonetheless, one's suspicions to seem too easily confirmed. In the meantime, all I can tell you is that I have some good and bad days, and in the early years, I did indeed smash every mirror I could find with a little hammer that I carried for this purpose. But before you pity me, look around and consider the happy game you're playing, the one where you are not already wholly forsaken. Another wee cheery poem there, though, is <laughs> Thanks for Don. That was, thanks, Don. That was absolutely fantastic. You probably can't hear um, the audience reactions. So I can just say that there was um, your familiar kind of um, poetry audience noises going on and a good bit of laughter as well. So um, I, know, I know it's a very okay. dis <laughs> I know it's a very disembodied kind of experience doing a reading online some point sometimes. So do you have any sense? You know why why this narrative turn was it a significant shift for you or is it just something which kind of happens and you're like, oh, wait on, actually, you know, I'm taking a different approach to this. Was well, it a conscious thing or? I, I think they become conscious things sort of in a kind of post-hoc sort of way when you're asked to justify yourself. I think, you know, yeah. it's just, a, uh, you know, but I mean, I think it's important to know that most justifications are sort of retrospective, you know. Um, although I was having a look at, you know, I was reading my work earlier, as I never do, like, and I thought, actually, there's much more narrative here than I gave myself credit for. I mean, if one should credit oneself with anything but it's just that it's compressed and, it, and, it, and as you say you know it usually happens within a kind of lyric framework but there's often stories going on but um but they're, but they're often nested within other structures but i think there's something about you know that old the point in your life when you have to feel you have to bear witness to your own experience um that requires not just length but longer lines and and because it's largely autobiographical, albeit science fictionalized, you know, um, it, it, there's a through line, there's a karmic thread, there's action and consequence, you know, there's one thing after another, you know, and in order to do that any sort of justice, I think, you know, sort of narrative is the only way. And also, if I'm totally honest, it's about kind of, 
who you orient yourself towards an audience. And I think narrative is a much more trustworthy form than other poetic turns you could take, especially at the moment when poetry is in a state of total flux and change and nobody's really got a handle on, on what's going on. Narrative is, is a really sort of almost a kind of atavistic throwback to a kind of a, a trustworthy kind, kind of storytelling, um, the, the, a form that poetry can take, you know, when That's you can believe yeah. it and believe the speaker. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, that's interesting. So in your um, book, recent book of essays, The Poem, um, you describe, I could try to get this right, prose as evoking and poetry as invoking. Do you think that a similar distinction can be made between narrative and lyric within poetry? You know, does narrative poetry evoke and lyric poetry invoke or... That's a, that's a great question. I mean, that could have kind of strung myself up there, but I think um, because I would still claim these were poems, I think they have a, a sort of they still take a strongly lyric um, tone, which is to say, most of the calculations that I make in the line are towards music rather than towards accuracy. You know, so I'll always sac sacrifice a fact or accuracy or any aspect of the truth if I can get a good line out of it. You know, if it sounds right. So that's the sort of if you like the sort of lyric uh, loyalty, the lyric principle there, uh, and that means that yeah, you are trying to do magic. You are trying to invoke. You are trying to conjure some physical sense of the thing that that you're talking about. Whereas a, a prose, I think, tries to make it sort of feel as if you were there. Whereas, whereas poetry, uh, there's no as if, you know, <laughs> you're trying to conjure it uh, out of the air, really, you know. I cling to this idea of poetry as a kind of occult form, you know, uh, of doing the devil's work at some level. Um, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I also wanted to kind of explore, um, so Zonal's based on autobiographical material, but you've very much taken a fantasy approach to it so it's there, there's science fiction in there you're drawing on the twilight zone um so it kind of op occupies this space between kind of fact and fiction um was there a reason why you took that approach to um exploring autobiographical topics was it more straightforward what's wh wh what was your thinking behind actually taking that approach uh, just trying to not get sued primarily. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, plausible deniability, all that. You know, it's just um, I've just finished a memoir. You know, and it's just like, and it goes up to um, to the age of twenty, and then it stops. And one of the reasons it stops is simply you're thinking after that, I'm going to have to wait for a lot of folk to be dead. You know, one of them. <laughs> you know, before this can come out. But I think um, it really was that that. that um, it's an old poetic freedom, you know, that it's a great day in a poet's life when you get up in the morning and you can and you realise you can lie about everything in order to make it more true, you know, that your allegiance is, is to the truth rather than the facts. Uh, and I think that, that, so there was a certain freedom, uh, you know, sort of uh, in, um, what's the word, what do they call it, autofiction, I guess, you know, taking the facts of your own life, but shoving them down a kind of genre filter, whether that happened to be science fictional or whether it happened to be just TV soap opera, uh, which one's life is anyway, or whether it happened to be like like sports videos. I mean, there's there's one that's just about, I'm obsessed with uh, American pool and billiards, so there's one that's just like a monologue by an old pool hustler, you know, but, but, but they're all about me. So it's quite interesting just shoving your life down these kind of odd uh, 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 generic filters just to see what will come out because it also means you can sort of get a bit of distance from it and as I say deny any responsibility for any connection to anyone living or dead <laughs> and was, was there re any reason why in particular you chose the twilight zone um, to drop on or to um, as a kind of frame for the writing yeah, it was really to do with that fact that you know sort of um, because most of them address things that are sort of quite dramatic and were first time events for me um, uh, the Twilight Zone is about that kind of, you know, someone saying that things don't operate the way that you think they do. People really do disappear, or the laws of nature don't work in the way that you think they do, you know? Um, so, uh, and so I needed a kind of magic realist frame, if you like, because that was actually my genuine experience of it, you know? And, and the, the Twilight Zone is kind of the, the really kind of obvious one to go to in a way. And uh, I'm sure others have done it, but uh, it seemed an obvious kind of 
as I say, filter to you know to to look at one's life. Yeah, and there seems to be a sort of theme as well. As I, I was as I was reading it, I felt there was a theme coming through it about the sort of roles and games which we play, as if actually the differences between um, what we think is autobiographical and what how we frame it. Basically, we're always framing, we're always playing a role, we're always playing a game. I felt like that kind of theme was coming through in the writing. Um, so by actually drawing upon um, more apparent kind of fictional devices, it was just actually highlighting that and going, do you know what, this is what we do all the time. But um, yeah, I'm going to be much more I mean, apparent only, about it. Yeah, I, I, absolutely that. I mean, not only are we making up as, as we go along, but also I think that it's important to know that we're... Um, the accounts that we give of our own experience are really often fictionalised and are quite false and, and often, you know, uh, stupidly kind of monocausal in a way that makes us easiest, uh, easier for them to, you know, to, to be explained to ourselves. Um, it's like that old thing. I, I suppose in a way it was trying to challenge through, uh, uh, hopefully in a slightly subversive way, this whole, whole idea that your life is a journey, which I think is a terrible metaphor. You know? it, just, it doesn't hold at all, you know, because if it's a journey, they all reach an identical ending point, you know, and it often sort of fills folk full of, you know, sort of all sorts of expectation and potential disappointment that if you had a better metaphor, you know, they wouldn't experience, you know. So I think it was a it was a way of kind of undermining that and, and, and showing that, the, the, the end up in the situation that you end up in, not through any kind of monocausal series of events, but by the confluence of all sorts of different narratives, you know, and all sorts of different, uh, you know, sort of uh, influences and all sorts of different moons and planets getting into alignment. You know, we're really complicated and we're multiple and, and we have more than one life that we, that we conduct simultaneously. And in terms of... Are you, are you working on a new collection now? Have you gone back to... I, I'd agree with you that actually having done quite a lot of thinking about story within poetry, that actually lyric poetry contains an awful lot of story. It's just kind of compressed. Um, if you're working on some new work now, have you gone back to a more familiar um, lyrical approach or would you try this kind of longer potential, you know, to sort of... Th through through narrative through the, through the longer lines through the longer narrative, um, is that something you think you'd try again? Uh, uh, well, you know what the experience kind of taught me, uh, you know, and it was that thing about reviewing your own life, you know, being at being at a jam, um, uh, and, and um, you suddenly realise that there's no progress. I mean, <laughs> one often goes backwards, and you get worse at things in life. Um, but, but, but the progressive model is the wrong one. And what happens is you just add competences and sometimes subtract them, but, but you know, to, 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 to your range of kind of knowledge and expertise or whatever, you know? So you sort of, you're everyone that you were before. You don't kind of graduate from these previous selves. And I think my, my approach to the stuff that I'm writing now is really to allow myself to go back to what I was doing 30 years ago or, or five minutes ago and, and accept that, you know, these people are still part of me and I still, you know, form one's personality and, and one can still write out of these modes, uh, you know, uh, and forms. Um, uh, so I, I think the idea is that you, you're just now allowed to choose between them, you know, rather than commit yourself to some idiotic idea about artistic progress, which just really doesn't survive any scrutiny. Just allow yourself to be all the people that you have been, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, and to hopefully project yourself into some future where you can be more people, you know, and add to those voices that you carry inside you. Talking about going back, I know that um, your original um, vocation, as it were, was to set out as a musician. Maybe this is a good moment to um, ask you if you would like to play us a little bit of music and then um, we'll have a bit more chat and we'll then hear a bit more poetry from you. Does that sound like a plan? Hey, absolutely, yeah. I, I wasn't sure what to do um, because it's a literary event and, you know, and, and, and most people sensibly hate jazz. So I think, well, <laughs> I'm just going to have broken a nail. That's the first thing. And I've had a drink. So these two things are mitigating against it. <laughs> but I'll probably, I'll just pick up a guitar and I'll just play something. I'll just make something up. Uh, and I'll try and make it like a, a, like a narrative thing. Uh, and, I, and then I'll just stop. Um, produces a guitar from under the desk. There you go. Um, and... Um, uh, and seamlessly switches up, uh, switches microphones to something that will sound better. Um, what pro? Look at this. There we go.
What does that say, Don, that we all break out into applause for music in the way that we didn't for the poetry? Um, that, that, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Was that genuinely improvised? That was fantastic. Sorry, Don, can you hear me? Hello. Sorry, Lucy, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you absolutely fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, did you hear any of that at all? Yeah, no, we, we absolutely did. It was absolutely fantastic. The sound quality actually um, came, came through really well. And I was just saying, um, what's it say that we all burst into applause afterwards um, in the way, we, the way we didn't for poetry? But no, that, that, that was absolutely great. <laughs> <laughs> there's, yeah, there's, a, there's something in that, isn't there? Yeah. I know, I know. Um, was that genuinely improvised, by the way? I'm afraid it was, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it gets easier. Um, uh, there's a there's an optimum level of alcohol below which the <laughs> performance quality is drops off heavily. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm always I actually did a lot of music training myself, but in kind of classical tradition, playing the oboe, um, and I'm always very um, envious of those people that actually actually can pick pick up a guitar and do some improvisation. Um, I'm going to go on to ask a few questions, if that's all right, about sort of narrative more broadly um, in poetry. Um, so you were one of the editorial team for the recently published Golden Treasury of Scottish Verse, um, which came out recently um, with Canongate. Um, I wanted to ask you whether, so you talked about narrative being maybe an older mode. Um, was there a significant amount of narrative in this anthology? And also, would you say that, I know that in the introduction, you all say that, that you say that you didn't set out with an agenda in terms of what the narrative was doing, but did you find that a narrative actually emerged in terms of the development of, Sc of Scottish poetry through the anthology? So kind of two questions in there. Is, is there a significant strand of narrative poetry within the anthology, and do you think the anthology itself has an overarching narrative? Um, 
I think sort of narrative. It's interesting. I think you sort of, you know, the, the, the material in the anthology reflects the, you know, um, the way that poetry and narrative have worked together, which is occasionally they've been close and sometimes they've been quite alien to each other. And I think until very recently, actually, we haven't really done much in the way of narrative and poetry, uh, you know, sort of except for the odd verse novel. You know, uh, so Les Murray's Freddie Neptune or, or, or Walcott's Ominous or something like that, you know, or, or Glenn Maxwell's work or uh, uh, what have you. There's not been an awful lot of narrative until I think we've seen um, more people working in spoken word and in the field of rap and hip hop move into narrative forms recently, which I think has been a really interesting development. And I think, again, it's a natural compensation for the lack of trust that we've built up with the audience. Um, you know, and the fact that so much, uh, you know, sort of poetry in the page, unfortunately, is speaking to other poets rather than to, you know, a, a general readership. And I think that, that that's created a space for, for narrative to come back as a, as a trustworthy form of poems. Uh, and I think that, um, that you know, the, 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 we would have been able to reflect that, I think, if we'd been able to draw in more recent work, but for sensible editorial reasons, we stopped at anyone born after 1979. So that rules, <laughs> I'm just off the top of my head, someone like, I've, we've just done a book at Picador by um, uh, Harry Josephine Giles, uh, which is a science fiction verse novel in Arcadian. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear it's a first <laughs> so it's, it's just a sort of cracking tale and it's the sort of thing one would have accept, accepted from and put in the Golden Treasury uh, and if we get a chance to revise the book you know we'll, 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 we'll have Harry Joe in it in 20 years time but, um, but I think it reflects the fact that because of the Golden Age television and because of the fact that we've conceded a narrative to other literary forms um, there hasn't been much of that for some time there are exceptions you know I'm, I'm thinking of this uh, Bill Herbert, for example, you know, as you, you know, Willie uh, W. N. Herbert as, as, uh, of Scots poets has worked in, uh, you know, in, in narrative forms. But really, there's no much, you know, it's just um, obviously there's the, anon the tradition of the anonymous ballad, and yeah. that's where you find the bulk of the narratives that are told, you know. Um, and, and, and those things that were kind of Kaliad pastiche of the anonymous ballad, you find those taken up again. But for the most part, um, it seems to have been slowly conceded, as I say, other art forms have, have, have taken up that role uh, and poetry ceased to be that kind of fireside uh, entertainment where you told these rattling tales. Um, uh, in terms of the narrative of the whole, sorry, Lucy, you asked this question about is there a narrative? No, really, and actually, we were at pains to disguise it because if you were to tell the story, <laughs> of Scottish poetry. It's a kind of bleak tale, you know? <laughs> and it goes, yeah, good, good, good. Lots of anonymous, probably a lot of involvement as sort of, you know, sort of, a, a, you know, uh, female practitioners, you know, in the uh, anonymous uh, 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 ballad tradition and, 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 and gales, and then uh, the, the makars, and then some good poets writing in Latin, you know, and some sort of, you know, early pre-metaphysicals, then John Knox, then nothing for 150 years. <laughs> you know, like not only dark theatres for 150 years, but nobody could write a line that's any good at all, you know, for like, you know, decade after decade. And then slowly it's kind of, you know, sort of, you, you, you see, you know, Ferguson and then Burns and then kind of early sort of romantic poets, and slowly that, you know, sort of it starts to rehabilitate itself, you know. And then the Victorians, there's a massive dip again, uh, as we go hills and rills and bubbling brooks and shady nooks, and then that's rubbish. And then, then it picks up again, uh, you know, at the start of the 20th century. So it's not a great tale. And that's the reason <laughs> that we randomised the contents so we could just showcase the great stuff that has been written through serendipitous juxtaposition. So we alphabetised the contents in order to disguise the kind of chronological sort of, you know, the timeline of the thing. So you wouldn't be, <laughs> you know, the, the, the Knox deficit. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a great story. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any poets in there who you've particularly drawn on, who've been particularly influential? Uh, I've got favourites. Um, I mean, it seems uh, wrong to. Um, I mean, my favourite. I mean, my favourite contemporary poet isn't in there. It's one of the editors. It's Kathleen Jamie, um, yeah. our, our uh, beloved marker. Um, 
But um, for reasons of nobility, discretion, and just all around fabulousness, we decided to leave ourselves out. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you know, it's very uncomfortable to put yourself in your own anthology, or it should be, we decided. So in that very Scottish way, we're, 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 um, Kathleen's work isn't in there. Um, but uh, Douglas Dunn's there, W.S. Graham, uh, uh, who we all adore, uh, is in there. Um, there's early lyric poems of Hugh McDermott when he was sounding like um, uh, Ezra Pound. They're in there, you know, the, those those uh, lovely poems of, of Violet Jacobs and, and, and Marion Angus that, that were so often missing from anthologies, they're in there. So there's, there's a, yeah, a lot of my favourite stuff, Scottish stuff is in there, as it would be. It's a very much a personal choice between the three of us rather than any kind of committee decision. So we just put our favourite stuff in. That was like the only editorial rule. Um. Fantastic. I'm going to um, end with one last question before asking you to um, read a bit more poetry and maybe play us another bit of music if you'd like to. Um, my own concern, I suppose, about narrative is how various stories become dominant um, and dictate both how we live our lives um, and then how we write about it. So I'm particularly interested um, in terms of my own practice and how formal experiment can actually open up space for new and different narratives um, and to actually challenge the same stories that we seem to tell over and over and over. Um, is this a perspective which you'd agree with or disagree with? I just feel like we um, have a tendency to keep on rewrite, rewriting and recycling the same stories, um, which actually kind of inhibits change and un un inhibits the potential for new stories to be heard. Um, is that, um, I suppose I'm kind of inviting responses to that, really. I, no, I think at some level that's a work of poetry. I mean, to be honest, if you, if you don't mind me for a second, just, just asking you as a practitioner, what is it that you feel has been missing in terms of those stories that have been, uh, you know, that, that, that have been told? Uh, you know, is it a, a stories told from perspectives of, of a, is, it, is it stories untold or is it methods of, t of, of telling stories that you feel has been missing from the uh, the palette. Uh, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll give the example of climate change. So I think that um, we have a very dominant narrative about climate change, that um, it's a dreadful thing. We're going to end up in um, catastrophe. Um, there's this very kind of clear, and so we need to take action now. So it's a very persuasive kind of narrative, which actually blocked me as a writer, because I thought, I don't want to write this same narrative, which keeps on being told this apocalyptic tale of climate change. So my interest is in actually how you can use form to actually experiment and play with that dominant narrative and see whether new stories can emerge, whether new meanings can emerge by actually using formal experiment to kind of break up this kind of dominant message. So are you talking about sort of spinning new stories rather than telling stories that are already in existence then? Sorry, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you, using experiments to try and break down the dominance of existing stories we tell, and by doing that, actually opening up space for new stories to emerge. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, 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 one worries <laughs> one's just, you know, at first instinct is to go for those off-the-peg forms that have been proven previously successful, do you know what I mean? As you, as you get more cautious, you know, <laughs> in your practice, you think, well, that works, or it worked for someone else, you know? And it might make one disinclined to sort of experiment in that way, you know, um, because with experiment, you know, comes the opportunity for failure, you know, so it's, um, um, but that's, that's got to be good. Young person's game, though, anyway. <laughs> um, I'm aware that we've had a lot of chat and we've, um, I don't feel like we've heard enough of your poetry yet. Would you treat us to a bit more poetry and another piece of music and then maybe a little be a chance for one last question, and then we'll draw things to a close. I, I think I may declare myself incompetent to play, so I'll, I'll probably read a couple of poems and then maybe we'll, uh, you know, one question might be the way to, to, to do it, Lucy, if that's okay. Fantastic, so, yeah, no problem. Jazz fans out there in the work, um, <laughs> the wrong end of this glass of wine. Um, although, uh, by way of um, jazz compensation, I'll maybe read... Um, 
poem about Chet Baker. It's, it's also about addiction. <coughs> um, uh, and uh, d d like, so like a lot of the stuff in this book, actually, d some of it's completely true. So the incident that I describe at the start has <laughs> happened exactly the way that I describe it, rather unbelievably. Um, so um, it's called Chet's Habit. <coughs> I was in Istanbul playing at the Jazz Festival and ran into Chet Baker in the hotel lift. It was 1987, the year before he tipped out the window, but when I met him, he was on methadone and blowing great. He looked like shit, though, like a tiny shrink-wrapped Charles Manson, more or less mummified, his toenails curling like lemon peel from his Jesus sandals. That was bad enough, but he was also wholly corrupt, something you could tell with your eyes closed. Chet was addicted not just to junk, but to really terrible ways of conducting his business. I contrast Bill Evans, his exact coeval, played it like the world's slowest suicide and kept it to himself. Chet, not so much. His aura was collateral damage, and you would become implicated in his tragedy if you passed him in the street. By the time I got to his floor, he'd already hit me up from a pair DM, and I just gave it to him, even though I was 23 with a broke-ass guitar signing on back in Brixton. I related all this to the drummer Jerry Hemingway that evening over a horrible dinner of lamb's brains and rice I'd accidentally ordered. It was the cheapest thing in the menu, but was too afraid to send back. Why would you do that to yourself? I'd asked in my jejun way. Well, two reasons, said Jerry, who was wise. Addiction limits the number of things you can think about, and that can be useful for artists. But did you know that the foods we're allergic to are often our favourite? People love what kills them. And because that makes no sense, getting a habit lets us do it anyway. God knows you're never going to find a reason. All this rang true. Even back then, I knew I should also always go in fear of honeydew melon and psychopathic narcissists, but that nothing was ever going to hold me back. I have since learnt that at the heart of the human condition, almost in a way that defines us, are the things that cause the very pain they alleviate. And something else, addictions are a social construct. There's always a pusher to smooth and polish the path. They always see us coming with our abandonment issues, our tendency to confuse love and refined sugar, our minor discomfort and agony. A speciality of poets, many of whom are addicted to sulpidine max, for which fine product, the painkiller's painkiller. Breakfast of champions. I was the poster boy for years. But many of them just can't bear our suffering, or if they're a parent, they're guilt over our suffering. And just as often, it's a way of showing love. Your mother addicted you to sweetness because she wanted to share the feeling it gave her, or some punter in the bar after the gig just wanted to do something nice for Lester Young, and they knew that booze was the thing Prez loved most in all the world. As if the paradox of our habit wasn't enough, we are often conducted into the arms of death by those who love us most. And all this just made Chet's decision even more economical. So yes, with her help, he'd simplified himself into addiction and something like evil. But I know some folk who, for reasons no more or less selfish, are all temperance and charity, and they are among the worst people I have ever met. Which is absolutely not to say they do no good. That's just another sentimental error. You have to see the whole picture. Let's not forget that when his teeth weren't kicked out, Chet played his horn like a cashiered angel, and his singing was like being sweet-talked by the void. Um, and I'll maybe just read a, a shorter one. Um, I say that. Oh, here's one, a shorter. Um, and I've never read this one out, uh, so I may regret this. Um, and it's called The Garden. <clears throat> I had been 90 years on Thera and still felt like an incomer. They were kind to me, though. And like any other local in the town, when my time came, I met with the curator of The Garden so I could choose the shape of my long sleep. In The Garden, you are fixed at that second of your life you were happiest and reside therein forever. I got the guided tour. There was a lot of fishing, family tableaus, holidays, many nativities. One deathbed scene that had clearly given someone a special delight. 
Because their joy proved, proved so fleeting, many chose a moment of success, prize givings, promotions, triumphs in the theatre and sports whose rules I never learned to follow. A few scenes made me think he'd looked into my file, but our lives are never as unique as we would have them. A man giving a piano recital, his eyes closed, bowed low before the keyboard as at an altar. A young naked couple in a single bed, closed on each other like a scallop. A hospital ward where a man stood open-mouthed as the newborn, he'd thought a lost cause, began to draw his mother's milk. He let me try a few, but most carried a seed of agitation and knew you would get to me in time. He did a fine job of spinning up an unseasonably warm morning in Ullapool and stopped me there a while as my migraine had lifted and I listened to the river and the birds in the early spring sunlight. I knew I still had time to start again, but now the bench was hard and the bird song too loud. When he thawed me out, I said, I know what I want. <coughs> I remember I'd been playing all afternoon with my brother on the beach at Kinghorn, a small settlement of huts by our northern sea, and had run, run myself ragged. I was very hot and lay down in the shadow of a dune in the cold, damp sand. I asked my brother to get his spade and turn the sand over me until only my face was showing, and I felt my weariness drain into the ground and the whole earth bear me up until I weighed nothing. At first, the curator looked at me like I was from another planet, and then remembering I was, said, I admit it's a curious one, but if that's what you desire, it will be my honour to arrange it. So we dug a shallow trench in the black soil by the flower beds, just my length, and I lay down in it. And he stopped everything again and gently filled the bed until the earth covered my legs, my body and my face and placed a sign nearby I should not be disturbed. Thank you, Dawn. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, okay, as, as, as a final question, so it's a bit like a, what, what's next for Dawn Patterson. When um, in your recent work and also what we've heard tonight, um, there's, I suppose there's a shadow. Shadow is the wrong word, word because um, the poems have so much energy, but there's a theme of death running through them. Um, and confronting the question of death and, and what that means and its approach. Um, and it makes me think of your poem, um, Lazarus. I can't remember which collection that was in. Um, and in this poem, Lazarus has died, comes back to life, and he actually finds contentment in being alive again after death because he realises he doesn't really need to worry about death any longer. Um, and I'm wor wondering, um, it's a slight, slightly tongue-in-cheek question, um, now you've had a collection which is exploring this question of death and um, its meaning. Are we now going to see a really happy, contented Don, having gone through that phase and see a really happy, <laughs> joy joyful collection of poetry? Is, is, that the, is that the final stage in the um, Don Patterson story of, of poetry? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> as, well, as the Irish uh, uh, saying goes, you have to start from somewhere else. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's going to happen, but it's um, but yeah, no, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, Lord Willen and the Creek don't rise, uh, you know, sort of a very une uneventful period in my life. You know? <laughs> um, I'm happy up in Kerry with my uh, with my partner and my two daft dogs. And um, and I think sort of any experimentation will be to do with the writing. So as I say, I've just finished this memoir, you know, uh, so that'll be good next year or the, or the Saturday the year after. So that's been a different sort of turn. That's been kind of an interesting thing to write. Um, uh, and I think I might just try my hand at, at, at some different forms because, you know, the, the older you get, the less is really at risk. You know, you, you think, you know, what, what's going to happen now? You know, you, you know, so you're going to get cancelled. You're going to lose your job. You're going to die. It's like, uh, even if you work, you know, it's like, eh. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, I might try my hand at writing some different things. Uh, so I have some ideas for some daft books that, 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 that I might write. One of them is called um, Emails to a Young Poet, which is a fantastically grumpy. I've, I've spent so <laughs> I kind of paid cheerleader for poetry. I think it's, it's time to let the other half rip. Um, it's, it's a fantastically whiny uh, uh, book about uh, what poets are really like. 
<laughs> and the youth. So I'm trying to open up the generation gap again. And just trying to the, the, the poetic guide to how not to make friends and not to influence them. Is <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's an anti self help book. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, I, I'm just going to um, draw things um, towards a close. Um, a reminder that um, Don's most recent book of essays, The Poem, um, is for sale. Um, I'm not sure how much you're actually going to hear this, Don, but can everyone maybe join me in a round of applause for Don? <laughs> really huge. Thank you. And a huge thank you as well to Wigton Book Festival um, for the invitation to host this event this evening. And um, I'm not quite sure what happens now um, at the end of this event, but th 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 thank you, everyone. Um, and see you again at another Wigton Book Festival event. Thank you. <laughs>